There's a saying about planning for war that nations always prepare to fight the last war, the war most recently won or lost. There's a lot to that. The last war is a war you know about, the mistakes you made and you hope, the things you should do to prevent their happening again. I call it thinking forward by looking back. As the decade of the 60s dawned, the Air Force felt pretty well prepared. We had taken the lessons of World War II and applied them to a new generation of weapons and aircraft. We had almost two decades to refine the battle doctrine that had so devastated Germany and Japan. We also had the world's healthiest economy and the sure knowledge that we could beat anyone in open battle. So nobody thought much of it in 1961 when the first American advisors were sent to a Southeast Asian backwater called Vietnam. It was just another hot spot in the Cold War, and we pretty well figured after getting a few loads of American firepower dumped on them, those sandal-wearing guerrillas would back right down. We knew that for a fact. The war in Vietnam started during World War II. While the Americans concentrated on beating the Japanese, all across Asia, various factions played an endgame for post-war power. The Chinese, for example, weren't effective against Japan because they were so busy fighting each other. Chairman Mao and his communist guerrillas versus Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists. The same was true in Vietnam. There were the revolutionaries, led by Marxist Ho Chi Minh, and anti-communists who were fighting as much to preserve their own privilege as they were French rule. The communist Vietnamese were fighting an unorthodox and very effective guerrilla war. They hit and ran, blending in with the countryside and the populace. Vietnam was a largely rural country with an economy based on subsistence farming. The Viet Cong, as the guerrillas were known, were decentralized, quick to adapt new tactics. They humiliated the French colonialists who had controlled the country for more than a hundred years. When the French pulled out, they left behind a government that was anti-communist, but hardly democratic. The United States, in its anti-communist zeal, decided to fill the power vacuum. On October 11, 1961, President Kennedy authorized Operation Farmgate, the deployment of the 4400th Combat Crew Training Squadron to South Vietnam. We arrived 151 officers and men strong, charged with the mission of building a South Vietnamese Air Force. The raw material we had to work with wasn't much. The South Vietnamese had 97 planes, most of them outdated and ill-maintained. We brought a couple of World War II bombers and transports, a handful of trainers, and the know-how of how to win an air war. We'd bomb Germany's industrial base to dust, and we'd do the same thing to the North Vietnamese communists. Within a couple of years, we'd help the Vietnamese train and field 14 combat-ready squadrons, 285 planes in all. The number of American advisors and aircraft in Vietnam kept growing. By the end of 1961, the original 16 American aircraft deployed in South Vietnam had grown to more than 90. Americans were there primarily to train South Vietnamese, but they also flew combat missions against communist insurgents. There was a belief at the time that the fast escalation of the air war against the communists would cripple their war-making capability and bring the war to a quick end. In 1964, before the public entry of the United States into the ground war, there was already a secret plan for massive air raids on 29 North Vietnamese cities and industrial centers. The planners back in the States, led by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, figured the war could be won largely from the air. It was a huge shift in the perception of air power by the military. Remember, it was only 30 years before that the likes of Billy Mitchell and Jimmy Doolittle had had to prove that air power had any military value. But by the early 1960s, the brass was ready to invest all military power in the Air Force. Though the massive air raids initially envisioned for Vietnam were never undertaken, the logic behind the raids carried the day. 
that the United States could wear down and eventually defeat the communists by bombing their cities. The United States entered the Vietnam War in earnest in 1964, after what was then referred to as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. The incident was an attack on an American warship by the North Vietnamese Navy, and the outrage the incident provoked in the United States led Congress to give President Johnson a free hand in running the war. What no one in the administration explained to Congress was that the Gulf of Tonkin Incident was not an unprovoked attack. In fact, the American ship was placed off the coast of North Vietnam specifically to be attacked. Once in place, the ship simulated the radio traffic that would take place leading up to an air assault against North Vietnamese ports. The not unforeseeable counterattack became Lyndon Johnson's cover story. Without it, he would have had to pay too heavy a political price for his buildup in Vietnam. The Johnson administration was made up of advisors collectively known as the Whiz Kids, holdovers from the Kennedy White House. They were statisticians and efficiency experts, confident that if the United States could just maintain a certain pace in the war, the enemy would eventually concede defeat. These guys were number crunchers, and they worked for a president who revered politics above everything. As Congress and the public were concerned about American involvement in Vietnam, Johnson promised to limit American involvement in the war. He had no intention of doing that, and buried the truth in a flurry of statistics. He did cut the number of American aircraft in South Vietnam, but he did it by deploying aircraft to bases off Vietnamese soil in Thailand or Guam, but within range of Vietnam. That meant flight crews arriving over drop sites were tired from long flights, and that the enemy they were sent to destroy had long since moved on through the jungle. Militarily, stationing the plane so far from the battlefield was a bad decision. Numerically, however, it made perfect sense. What was important to the whiz kids back in Washington wasn't the real military effect of the missions. What they cared about was the numbers of planes on the ground and the tonnage of bombs dropped from the sky. In effect, the numbers became the reality. Every time we turned around, there was another rule of engagement. Another smart thing we weren't allowed to do because it would have created political problems back home. For example, Russian and Chinese weapons were flooding into North Vietnam by boat. Well, that's an easy enough problem to solve. You blow the boats out of the water. But the honchos back in Washington knew if we started blowing Russian boats out of the water, support for the war back home would evaporate amid fears of nuclear confrontation. So we weren't allowed to bomb the boats or the harbors or just about anything else. We had to let the ships bring the material in and then let the harbor crews process it. Finally, once the supplies were safely hidden away out in the jungle, we were allowed to try to destroy them. <laughs> that, to us vets of World War II, seemed like a ridiculous way to fight a war. The communist strength was concentrated in the rural areas. It was there, after all, that the anti-colonialist feelings ran deepest. But the countryside was also where the American strategy of bombing the Vietnamese into submission had the least effect. All the technology that had been developed since World War II had been developed with World War II in mind, which meant bombing cities, industrial sites, bridges, and tightly packed formations. In Vietnam, with an economy based on subsistence farming and a decentralized enemy, it would be hard to imagine a less effective weapon than massively applied air power. But that was the strategy the whiz kids had wrapped up in the American flag, and to dispute the tactics was to be disloyal to the underlying anti-communist ideology. We ended up with a two-tiered approach to air war. Closest to the ground were the smaller aircraft, the F-105s and 104s. They worked on low and fast, doing the job that in earlier wars would have been done by artillery. When troops on the ground engaged the enemy, they'd call in an air response and get the hell out of that part of the jungle. We'd come in hauling napalm and burn everything within a mile of the drop coordinates. <laughs> 
Our assumption was that somewhere in the cinders, there lay enemy dead. The second tier was the B-52s. Buffs, they were called, for big, ugly, fat fellows. Flying in from Guam and Thailand, each B-52 could drop 30 tons of bombs. Well, they weren't particularly accurate, but the swath of destruction they spread on the ground was awe-inspiring. One B-52 flying alone could wipe out an area the size of 10 football fields, scorch the whole thing down to rubble with high-explosive 500-pounders, and we sent them in waves. We flew the missions and sent back the reports, and the guys in Washington calculated how many enemy had died and told the public we were that much closer to the end of the war. The air war changed forever when the North Vietnamese started taking delivery of Russian surface-to-air missiles. The SAMs were installed to protect North Vietnamese cities from American bombers, making Hanoi, the capital of North Vietnam, the most heavily defended city in the world. As the Soviets moved in their anti-aircraft missiles, word came down to the flyers of one of the most ridiculous restrictions any military man ever had to live under. Because the SAM batteries were being built by Soviet technicians, they couldn't be bombed while they were under construction. The White House feared the repercussions should Soviet technicians be killed. Once the SAM sites had been built, they remained off limits during testing and shakedown, their most vulnerable time. Again, they were being manned at that point by Soviets. It was only once the missile batteries were active, once they were truly dangerous and difficult to knock out, that the rules of engagement allowed American flyers to target them. So for months, armed American aircraft would fly over undefended SAM sites, watching the construction progress. Only when the missile sites started shooting down American aircraft could American aircraft shoot back. SAMs were a new problem. The whiz kids back in Washington didn't have a pat answer for it, so it was left to the guys actually in Vietnam to find a solution. It was one of the only times the whiz kids let the military people make military decisions and the military guys came up with one of the few things in Vietnam that actually worked, the wild weasel. The wild weasel wasn't a plane or a bomb or any other piece of equipment. It was a job. The wild weasel was a pilot, at first flying an F-105 and later a 104, who'd come in ahead of the strike package painting himself on the enemy radar and hanging around in the bad zone long enough for the enemy to take a shot at him. Once the North Vietnamese lit up their SAM radar, the sites were easy for the strikers to locate and destroy. And it didn't take long for the North Vietnamese to recognize the tactic, but it still left them with no good way to respond. In late 1967, American intelligence started to report huge increases in the number of troops and supplies moving down the Ho Chi Minh Trail from North to South Vietnam. Analysts agreed that the North was about to launch an offensive, but no one knew where or when. One of the largest buildups was near a marine airstrip called Khe San, in the highlands near the Laotian border. Two full North Vietnamese divisions took up residence in the hills around the base, Convincing American strategists, the offensive would be aimed at the northern section of South Vietnam. The fighting accelerated gradually, but by January 11, 1968, the siege of Khe San was in full swing. We pulled out all the stops to win at Khe San. We flew thousands of bomber missions against enemy troop concentrations, sometimes just a few yards from the American perimeter. With the base cut off from ground we supply, we brought in food, ammunition, and medicine by air. The C-130 pilots landed on strips, cratered by enemy mortars, and took off blindly through thick clouds of smoke. We had single days when a hundred transports landed and took off, dumping supplies and carrying out wounded, while the fighting around them went on at full military power. Our job was tough. <laughs> 
but it was nothing compared to Marines down on the ground. <sighs> Those boys really took it, and they gave it back, too. The North Vietnamese weren't going to over on that base. No way. Ten days after the siege of Khe San started, on the Vietnamese holiday of Tet, the North Vietnamese launched their offensive. It was larger than the numbers guys back in the White House thought possible. The Viet Cong fought their way onto the grounds of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon and were able to sabotage key American facilities from within. Ironically, the emphasis on air power, largely irrelevant in a rural guerrilla war, also hurt the South during the Tet Offensive. Given fighting in friendly straits, there was simply no way for the American aircraft to ride to the rescue. You can't bomb your own troops, your own allies. So the fighting turned nasty, street to street, house to house. We watched from above as the siege of Quezon continued. On some days, the fighting got so bad that the transports couldn't even land. They dropped their cargo effectively enough, but on those days, the wounded couldn't be flown out for medical attention. We bombed and strafed and naped everything that moved outside the perimeter. And when the perimeter was breached, we occasionally had to bomb our own base. The numbers we ran up, well, the boys in Washington must have been proud. We went through racks of 750-pound bombs, the way a kid goes through potato chips. For four months, we flew thousands upon thousands of sorties around that base. And when the North Vietnamese finally pulled out, the brass back home tallied up the numbers and announced a great victory. I don't know if I'd buy that. The Marines abandoned Khe San not long after the siege ended. With the North Vietnamese gone, the brass said, there was no reason to keep the base going. We understood the logic of it. The idea that war could be reduced to strategic chess moves that rendered the actual holding of ground irrelevant. But somehow it just didn't sit right. The North Vietnamese had come because the Marines were there. After four months of battle, they left. And the Marines left. And nothing else had changed. It just didn't sound like victory to me. In 1968, largely as a result of the Tet Offensive, Lyndon Johnson declined to run again for the presidency. Richard Nixon, who had sworn off politics years before, won the election based on his promise of a secret plan to end the war. After his election, Nixon revealed his plan. He would bomb the North Vietnamese to the negotiating table. He increased the bombing of civilian areas in the North, and the pressure did, in fact, drive the North Vietnamese to talk peace in Paris. When the North Vietnamese proved not to be serious about negotiating peace, Nixon dusted off the Air Force's original plan to bomb the North, put down on paper, and filed away in 1961. Heading into his re-election campaign in 1972, Nixon ordered the bombing and mining of North Vietnamese harbors, cutting off the supplies from China and the Soviet Union that killed so many Americans. He ordered enormously destructive bombing in the North, stopped making conciliatory gestures, and promised publicly that if the North didn't get serious about peace, he would bomb them back to the Stone Age. After years of tiptoeing around public opinion, the Air Force was at last fighting a war on its own terms. Freed of constraints, Air Force flyers hit whatever targets were deemed militarily significant, no matter what world reaction might be. The plan worked well enough. We bombed, and free of ridiculous terms of engagement, we did a lot of damage. Imports into North Vietnam slowed to a trickle. The flow of supplies to the South virtually ceased, and before long, the North Vietnamese were talking peace. You ask any of the guys on the line, that's the way we should have fought the war from the beginning. You ask me, Vietnam's not a fight we should have picked at all. It never should have been our war. <laughs> 
Nixon took a lot of flack for the way he fought the war. The increasing public sentiment was just to get out. But he waited, handing the control of the war slowly to the South Vietnamese while pulling American troops out. He wanted, he said, peace with honor. In his own mind, he must have got it, because in January 1973, the delegates at the peace talks in Paris signed a treaty, and by August 15th, we'd run our last bombing run over Southeast Asia. American air power hadn't proved invincible, and the limits of that air power, not previously recognized by the flyers themselves, were now apparent to all. You can bomb them to dust, one flyer said as he packed up to go home, but the war isn't won until you control the ground. The Air Force, for so long fighting for recognition, had come full circle. It was a bitter homecoming for most of us Vietnam veterans. We had escaped the insanity of war, only to be welcomed home, not to cheers, but condemnation. The steamy jungles of Southeast Asia had stolen our youth and shaken the whole nation's faith. Worst of all, we had lost a war we all knew we could have and should have won. The country the Vietnam veterans returned to was much different from the one they had left. When Americans first entered the war, they tapped their toes to the relatively innocent beat of Elvis Presley, Nancy Sinatra. When we got out, it was to the psychedelic cacophony of Jimi Hendrix and Jefferson Airplane. Men and women in uniform were the scapegoats for an unpopular, mismanaged war. The uniforms they once wore with such pride were now magnets for ridicule and contempt. The country seemed to be coming apart at the seams. The military itself was not immune to the social issues rending America. Racial tensions and the struggle for equal opportunities for women evident in cities and on campuses were just as apparent on military bases. There was a sense that America, which had played such a great part in the victory over fascism, was going down to defeat in the war on communism. And that defeat was caused by a simple loss of will. The military has long been at the vanguard of social change, albeit not always willingly. Remember, President Truman ordered the total integration of blacks into the military back in 1948, years before the civilian world desegregated. And even though a few separate black military units hung on after Truman's order, the armed forces still led the way. When President Nixon abolished the draft in 1973, the military became an all-volunteer force. The creation of this professional military allowed the services to enforce higher standards for incoming recruits. The days of troubled young men joining the service to avoid jail were in the past. The fact that the military could now choose who joined their ranks, coupled with the massive technological growth spurt in the 70s, really changed the face of the American military. And the Air Force, the place where you could get paid to learn how to fly, got the pick of the recruiting class. The number and the capability of new Soviet weapons, fighters, bombers, missiles, pouring off assembly lines was staggering. We tried to keep up because we believed that the only way to keep the Cold War cool was matching capability for capability, tactical advantage for tactical advantage. But we still planned and trained based on being outmanned and outgunned. The belief was that we might not win the war, so the war couldn't be fought. Certainly with nuclear warheads trained on every American city, the concept of victory was virtually meaningless. So the United States had to prevent war by showing strength. 
Even as its deterrent role in the Cold War expanded, the post-Vietnam budget was slashed by nearly a third. The Air Force poured money into high-tech education and research and development of the next generation of weaponry in hopes that we could intimidate superior numbers with superior force. Those of us who had flown the F-4 Phantom Jet during the Vietnam War knew it was a workhorse. When there was a lull in the dogfighting, we used the Phantoms as bombers and escort fighters. It was still a valuable, serviceable aircraft, but it was 10-year-old technology. There was no doubt the Air Force needed a new jet fighter, and we wanted one that had been designed especially for our missions. Now remember, as good as the F-4 was, it had originally been designed for the Navy. Immediately following the war, a couple of new and exciting aircraft designs made the leap from the drawing board to the development stage. Along with new technology, lessons learned from Vietnam were incorporated into the new jets. The F-15 Eagle by McDonnell Douglas was a single-seater air superiority fighter designed to knock down other aircraft from enormous distances. Boy, it was a dream to fly. Look at that canopy. It gave us pilots an incredible amount of visibility. And it maneuvered so well. Some pilots swore up and down that the Eagle could turn square corners in the sky. <laughs> I don't know about that, but with a top speed of close to a thousand miles an hour, you'd better believe it was an exciting machine to fly. The F-15 Eagle took full advantage of the technological revolution. It had the latest high-tech radar and navigation equipment and was designed to work closely with airborne radar and command and control planes. Its air-to-air -air firepower was also impressive. It had an M61A six-barrel Gatling gun, along with four Sparrow and four Sidewinder missiles. But all that technology didn't come cheap. Every Eagle came with a whopping price tag of $20 million. A cheaper, smaller alternative to the F-15 soon came rolling off assembly lines. The General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon. It was called a swing force fighter because it was designed to handle both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missions. You know how a cowboy can sense a horse with a fiery spirit? Every pilot who sat in the cockpit knew that the F-16 Fighting Falcon was something special. Now, I know the official story is that the first flight of the F-16 was on February 2nd, 1974. But that was for the military brass and the marching bands. The real first flight took place the day before. Now, remember, the F-16 was really the first jet to be flown almost totally by computer. <laughs> we called it the electric jet because of its fly-by-wire controls. The pilot tells the plane what he wants it to do, and the plane decides how best to do it. He moves the stick, and the computer drives the flaps and power and other variables. It was a big adjustment for the pilot. Anyway, the day before the official flight, we were practicing the takeoff run, just rolling up and down the runway. But every time we'd get the Falcon close to takeoff speed, that damn jet would try to take off. The pilots had to work to keep it on the ground. The chase crew saw how bumpy the ride was getting. The tail kept hitting the runway. They were shouting, take off, take off. <laughs> Finally, the pilot stopped jerking the reins, and that horse took off. Oh, it was a sight. Now oh, the brass got to see it the next day, so they got their show. <laughs> and we kept our sneak preview a secret. The F-16 had a sleek new design. The wings were placed so far back on the body of the plane, pilots couldn't even see them from the cockpit. The running joke among pilots was that you didn't really fly an F-16, you wear it. The Falcon's main task was air superiority, keeping the sky clear of enemy fighters. 2, 12 o'clock. Falcon 2, just pay vision one. Rally 2, rally 2, I'm engaged on the man on the right. Down slicing left. I'm up to road 2, 12. Road 2, 12. 
But the flexible Falcon is also capable of precision bombing. In fact, F-16 pilots spend most of their training time practicing for bombing missions. When they take on this role, the F-16s are called killer bees. Until 1967, the Air Force had never bothered to buy a close support aircraft. Vietnam made clear the need for a rough and tumble aircraft, one that could operate from short, unpaved frontline airstrips and deliver undeniable killing power. Enter the A-10 Thunderbolt II, affectionately called the Warthog. Kind of easy, do you want through the strafe or go through high? You can strafe too. Okay, coming in. And that's it, that's it, one and two, oh, great. This jet was the Air Force's answer to the thousands of tanks the Soviets had deployed in Europe. The rugged warthog can take a beating from ground fire and keep flying. It's also larger than most tactical attack aircraft because it's built around a massive 30 millimeter gun. They designed the gun first. The plane came later. From the first tentative hundred yards of the Wright Flyer to the gallant global soaring of the F-16, aviation technology had come a long way in only 70 years. But the pace is slowing. In the 40s and 50s, the military bought six new fighter systems. Through the 60s and 70s, only two. The reason is simple. Aircraft are lasting longer because our methods for upgrading have improved dramatically. The aircraft itself, the platform we call it, doesn't need to change because the components inside are so easy to alter. The electronics, the weapon systems can be pulled out and replaced as needed. A good example is the B-52. The men who flew the Strato Fortress during Vietnam would be hard pressed to find anything familiar on today's aircraft. Bombing systems, structure, armament, virtually everything aboard has been modernized. Though it still drops bombs, but it's been outfitted with cruise missiles as well, meaning that it can strike a target from hundreds of miles off. Modernization became the key to extending the service life of aircraft. Old platforms were outfitted for new missions. The lethality of weapons systems was altered almost constantly as missions and methods were refined. New technology joined with old. New recruits learned from battle-hardened vets. And a new Air Force emerged. Doing more with less, that became our bylaw. Since the end of Vietnam, we had several hundred thousand fewer people, yet our global responsibilities kept expanding. We had less money, but the arms race with the Soviets was still the main Cold War battlefield. We knew that we would have to work harder, train harder, and be far more flexible than ever before. The Air Force had entered the computer age with a vengeance. To make sure people kept up with the technology, recruits spent months and months in the classroom. It became an Air Force of technical specialists. Officers and enlisted men and women were encouraged to go to night school. The new Air Force not only recruited, but created college graduates. What they were making was the first true 21st century military force. Veterans Day, 1982. A reflective wall of black granite begins healing the wounds of a nation. The names etched on the wall echo a final goodbye to families and friends. And living veterans of the war in Vietnam finally receive a hero's homecoming. As the stain of Vietnam begins to fade, Americans discover a renewed faith in their nation's military. Leading the parade is newly elected President Ronald Reagan. His administration orchestrates the most effective buildup of peacetime forces in history. Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger gains approval from Congress 
to spend billions of dollars rearming America's skeleton forces. For the Air Force, this means more tactical units will be getting new fighter and attack aircraft. The expanded military budgets also allow the Strategic Air Command to pursue a replacement for the B-52 bomber. There was some heated debate in the corridors of the Pentagon about a new bomber. Many wondered if the Air Force really needed another generation of manned bombers. The battlefield of the future was one of missiles, not airplanes. But a new nuclear deterrent strategy gave the manned bomber a new lease on life. The concept was called the Strategic Triad. It relied on a combination of long-range bombers, land-based ICBMs, and missiles launched from submarines to deter nuclear war. Altitude, we got airspeed. The traditional manned bombers were the most flexible element of the strategic triad. After all, a bomber crew could always turn around and come home if a nuclear strike is canceled after takeoff. Air Force leaders had spent nearly 20 years studying different designs for a new low-level high-speed bomber, and they finally decided on the B-1. In 1977, just as the new bomber was ready to go into production, President Carter decided to spend the limited defense dollars on the development of the cruise missile and other smart weapons. Three years later, President Reagan reversed the decision and authorized additional funding to send 100 B-1 bombers into production. And he kept the smart weapons, too. President Reagan took an early stand on communism with his strategic defense initiative. Affectionately called Star Wars, the SDI program focused on developing a defense against intercontinental ballistic missiles from outer space. The Air Force had a limited role in supporting the research and development of the project. Over the next few years, Star Wars would generate much publicity and heavy criticism. There were clear signs that the Soviet Union was experiencing serious financial problems. With the evil empire focused on repairing its own economy, there didn't seem to be a pressing need for technological saber-rattling, especially at American taxpayer expense. So after years of research and billions of dollars, Star Wars was abandoned. But the program had prompted the subtle yet momentous transition from the concept of air power to that of space power. The great increases in military spending during the Reagan administration had indeed worked to the disadvantage of the Soviet Union. The Soviets could no longer afford to match capability for capability. During the mid-1980s, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and President Reagan began a historic series of nuclear disarmament talks. There were encouraging signs that these summits might be the beginning of the end of the Cold War. By the end of 1989, the communist domination of most of the Eastern Bloc nations had withered. The Berlin Wall, the most potent visible symbol of the Cold War, came crashing down. The United States was left standing as the world's only superpower. In 1988, Lockheed unveiled an aircraft unlike any other the world had ever seen. Years of top secret research and development resulted in a futuristic aircraft which was, when flown at night, virtually invisible to both the eye and radar. All of us old timers laughed at first. <laughs> After all, who needs radar to see a plane that ugly? But those engineers sure proved us wrong. They had actually designed a plane that was invisible to any existing radar and couldn't be detected by its own heat emission. The stealth sneaks quietly behind enemy lines, drops its precision payload of laser bombs, then slips away as quietly as it came. 
The stealth is a single seater, so every mission is truly a solo mission. And take it from me, that's a major responsibility when you're flying an aircraft that's worth a hundred million dollars. The F-117 was by far the most expensive aircraft ever built. The end of the Cold War inevitably brought demands for severe budget cuts, and the stealth, along with many other Defense Department programs, came under heavy fire. After all, how could the military justify spending so much money when the world was entering an era of peace? War, as we knew it, was over, wasn't it? It's a post-Cold War world. The Iron Curtain has collapsed. In the summer of 1990, Germany is reuniting after decades of separation. The Soviet Union struggles with fledgling democracy and growing economic freedom. As America surveys the world scene, no great single threat remains. The main topic of discussion on Capitol Hill is how to spend the so-called peace dividend, defense dollars that now can be diverted to domestic programs. In response, the military redesigns itself, cutting troop numbers and refining mission statements. In many respects, settling in to enjoy that for which they had worked so long, a world at peace. But that peace was not global. Saddam Hussein's Iraq was reeling from its protracted war with neighboring Iran. Although Hussein claimed victory, eight years of some of the most brutal warfare the world had seen had exhausted the resources of the Iraqi nation and its people. The war left Iraq billions of dollars in debt to countries that had supported their efforts, mainly Kuwait and other Gulf nations. Saddam insisted that the massive war debt should be forgiven because his soldiers had protected the rest of the Arab world from the threat of Iran. He ignored the fact that the feudal war with Iran was his idea. Faced with a devastated economy and pressing war debts, the temptation of taking the rich, virtually undefended oil fields of his tiny neighbor Kuwait was too great to resist. In the pre-dawn darkness of August 2nd, 1990, hundreds of Iraqi tanks pour across the Kuwaiti border. Within 24 hours, Saddam's elite Republican Guard takes control of government buildings, banks, the international airport, even the Emir's palace. Hussein called it annexation and claims the area known as Kuwait has for most of history been a part of Iraq. The economic implications of the invasion were staggering. By adding Kuwait's oil to its own, Iraq had in one day gained control of a full fifth of the world's oil reserves. If the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was his next target, and it likely was, Saddam could easily have a stranglehold on half of the world's oil supply. Six days after the invasion, President Bush announced the rapid deployment of American forces to the Middle East to deter any further aggression and to protect Saudi Arabia. The call went out. The mission was clear. Operation Desert Shield had begun. Our first priority was to get squadrons of combat aircraft to the desert. We flew our F-16s and A-10s across the ocean from the States, refueling along the way. F-111s came down from England, F-15s from Germany. Putting us there like that was a risk. We didn't have the supplies or support crews to fight effectively. Consider that my jet alone consumes hundreds of spare parts on a single combat sortie, and that's not counting the ammunition. There are dozens of people who make up my ground crew, and they need their equipment and their supplies. Put it all together, and you begin to see that our presence in Saudi in those first few days was more bluff than anything else. That's where the military airlift command stepped in. The Mac crews worked non-stop hauling critical items to the Gulf while we just sat there, looking up the road to Kuwait and wondering if Saddam's tanks were on their way toward us. The Air Force had spent years building the airlift capability to support a major war in Europe. Systems were in place, aircraft were well maintained, and people were just waiting for the word to shift into high gear. 
So the U.S. was never lacking in airlift capacity to support the Gulf operation. Indeed, the Air Force used less than half of its airlift capacity throughout the entire operation. During World War II, the Nazi's Desert Fox, Field Marshal Rommel, discovered an essential truth about desert war. Whoever controls the skies controls the movement of troops on the ground. And that lesson was not lost on General Norman Schwarzkopf, a veteran of the war in Vietnam who'd been assigned as the commander-in-chief of Allied forces in the Persian Gulf Theater. His battle plan called for an intense, massive air campaign to shape the battlefield in preparation for a ground offensive. He knew that our ground forces could beat theirs, but he didn't want to risk large numbers of casualties. Schwarzkopf would use air power to eliminate certain enemy capabilities, which would deny Saddam the opportunity to inflict casualties. The first priority of the air war would be to take down Saddam's ability to communicate with and control his troops. Next, we would knock out the Iraqi systems which could create mass casualties, long-range weapons capable of carrying nuclear, biological, or chemical warheads. Those two things would leave us free to target enemy forces in the field. As the plan for invasion began to take shape, it became clear that our stealth fighters would make the first strikes of the air war. But we needed some way to be absolutely sure that the Iraqis couldn't see us. So we devised a little test. It was a long trip to Baghdad and back. So we knew we would have to top off our fuel tanks right before we entered Iraqi airspace. There was no way to hide the huge refueling tankers from the Iraqi radar, so we didn't even try. Instead, several times a week, the tankers would fly close to the border and stay there for hours on end. Soon enough, the tankers became a routine blip on the Iraqi radar. What their radar couldn't see were the stealth fighters flying with them. One day, while flying close to Iraqi airspace, we intentionally came out of stealth mode so we would appear on Iraqi radar. Our planes made a dash for the Iraqi border, but just before we crossed it, we switched into stealth mode and turned back. To the Iraqis, it looked like our fighters had simply disappeared, and we were hoping they'd guess that we'd just dropped down too close to the ground to be seen. Well, the next day, Baghdad, assuming exactly what we'd wanted them to assume, started bellyaching about our fighters entering their airspace. <laughs> it was good press for Saddam, but it told us that the F-117s, with transponders off, were indeed invisible to the bad guy's radar. <laughs> They hadn't seen us turn back. January 15, 1991. Saddam had until midnight to pull his forces out of Kuwait. He didn't budge. The world held its breath and waited. Months of nerve-wracking waiting had finally given way to this night. We had gone over the plan so many times, we knew it by heart. We had to. More than 400 combat planes and hundreds more support aircraft would be crowding the skies above Iraq over the next few hours. For safety's sake, the timetable had to be precise. There was no room for error. a.m. Saudi time. Ten stealth fighters slip out of Saudi airspace into Iraq. Silently, their computerized navigation systems guide them through the half-hour flight to downtown Baghdad. Flying undetected over the city, a slight press of buttons on pilots' control sticks delivers laser-guided bombs to crucial targets. Early warning radar control centers 
radio towers that form the nucleus of Saddam's communication network, and the Iraqi Air Defense Headquarters. In a matter of minutes, the heart of Saddam's air defense is cut out. Stealth pilots skirt through a lethal barrage of anti-aircraft artillery from below, but they keep their bombs on target. In only 15 minutes, they guide their invisible planes above the flak and head for home. The opening round had gone precisely as planned. So we're looking good. All right, 10 Delta. seconds to release. Right here. 50,000 feet, that makes it 40, that looks good. Coming on the pickle button. We're looking good, clear to pickle. On the pickle button, it's swinging right and left. So yeah. I'll take what I can right here. Right Two, that. one. Laser's off. Bomb's gone. Bomb's gone. Roger that. Right turn. Coming right. Coming right. Immediately after the stealth attack, other Allied aircraft struck targets across Iraq. 10 seconds. Shell 4-1, I've got to tell Five, you though, I think that's wedged to the south. Four, three, two, one. my position one. for about 10 Did miles. The impact. Boom! Oh, yes! We destroyed that thing bigger than Dallas. Okay, coming right. F-15s and British tornadoes accompanied by EF-111 radar jammers hunt and destroy Scud missile launchers. The F-111s also go after Iraq's industrial sites and power grids. Other coalition pilots fly risky low-altitude strike missions against enemy air bases. Once they've destroyed the planes on the ground, the tornado pilots put the airstrip itself out of commission, scattering a generous layer of mines which crater the runway and discourage repairs. That was an excellent splash. Other airfields face the wrath of American B-52 bombers. By dawn, most of Iraq's military infrastructure lay in heaps of rubble. Allied air power had made an impressive debut. Hussein braced himself for the mother of all battles. Soon after the beginning of the air war, we pilots began fighting a new enemy, the weather. An unseasonable front had moved in, covering most of Iraq and Kuwait with low, thick clouds. Many of us were stuck on the ground until the weather cleared. Other elements conspired to slow the progress of the air war. While most of Saddam's Scud missile launchers had been destroyed on the first night of the air war, many mobile launchers remained. Right off the bat, Saddam started firing Scuds at Israel, trying to draw the Israelis into the war. The big question was whether he would arm his missiles with deadly chemical or biological agents which would have forced Israel's hand. The coalition stepped up their search-and-destroy missions, diverting a hundred planes a day to the effort, mainly to convince Israel that they didn't need to enter the war, that everything that could possibly be done to stop the Scuds was already being done. A-10 warthogs swept the desert roadways by day, and at night, F-15s and F-16s circled over probable launch areas. Also deployed against the Scuds was the Army's Patriot Missile Defense System. The Patriot, originally developed as an anti-aircraft system, had only recently been adapted as an anti-missile system. While the Allies never did stop the Scuds, the launches went down from five a day to three a week. In the months leading up to Desert Storm, we were told that Saddam's Air Force would be a formidable foe. Once the air war started, every time the Iraqi pilots came up to fight, we shot them down. Splash two, OPEC two, splash two. OPEC one is engaged, second plugger, come off high. When they couldn't survive in the air, they started hiding their aircraft in shelters on the ground. So, we went after the shelters. We destroyed nearly 300 of their aircraft. Saddam's response? Two weeks into the air war, he had all of his Air Force commanders executed. On the ground, the Air Force turned its might on the elite Republican Guard. It was the Guard forces who had invaded Kuwait, laying waste to the land and butchering thousands of innocent people. 
The conventional wisdom was that if you could destroy the Republican Guard, you could eliminate most of the military support for Saddam Hussein. The Guard were dug in north of Kuwait, in Iraqi territory, and while the B-52s pummeled their positions, other aircraft went after artillery, armor, and all the logistical support the Guard depended on. The Guard was cut off, alone in the desert, with B-52s flying non-stop missions overhead. It's uh, hard to imagine a more difficult position to be in. We flew combat sorties around the clock. Our ground crews worked tirelessly to keep us in the air, grabbing a few hours of sleep when they could. And then they were back on the job, loading munitions, refueling, and making sure the aircraft we were taking up were in tip-top shape. Every day, I put my life in the hands of 19, 20-year-old kids. But they were pros, every one of them. I've never been prouder of anyone in my life. It became clear that despite the impact of Allied airstrikes on his country, Saddam had no intention of releasing his chokehold on Kuwait. February 24th, 1992. 39 days of air war gave way to a massive ground offensive. Saddam had surrounded Kuwait with minefields and World War I-style trenches, figuring that those tactics had worked well in the relatively primitive war with Iran and would work well now. What he didn't know, what he couldn't know, because the air assault had for all practical purposes blinded him, was that the ground forces he faced had moved. Under cover of the air assault, a half million coalition troops had shifted to the west, away from Saddam's defenses and into the open field. Our job was to lend close air support to advancing ground troops, to keep Saddam's troops pinned down so the ground troops could move. And they did move, too, fast enough that we had trouble keeping track of them. Air planners started letting the guys on the ground call our plays, diverting us from our always obsolete plan to the spots where the ground forces needed us the most. If the ground campaign was slowed by anything, it was slowed by surrendering Iraqi soldiers. Weeks of nightly B-52 bombing raids took a terrible toll on Iraqi soldiers in the southern desert. The rolling thunder of detonating bombs made sleep impossible, and the infrastructure damage made resupply impossible. Allied columns moving forward at full speed found themselves mired not in minefields, but in a sea of hungry, pathetic Iraqis who no longer had the will to fight. On February 25th, Saddam ordered the retreat from Kuwait City. The Iraqis took everything they could carry, weapons, TV sets, liquor, furniture, everything, and loaded it up on anything that would move. <laughs> the fools. They'd already lost the war. Did they think that we were gonna let them just walk off with all that booty? By dawn, the highway to Basra was blocked by thousands of destroyed vehicles and tens of thousands of Iraqi dead, some still clutching stolen trinkets in their hands. On February 28th, President Bush declared a ceasefire. The objective had been met. Kuwait was liberated. The ground war had lasted only 100 hours. However brilliantly the ground campaign was planned, what Desert Storm will be remembered as is a perfectly executed air campaign. And that, ironically, may prove problematic in the future. In a sense, it has left in the American mind the impression that there is such a thing as a push-button war, that at relatively low cost to ourselves, we can inflict tremendous damage on our enemies. But if you look at Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we're not likely to see another war like that. Every circumstance was optimal, from the geography to the not entirely rational nature of our enemy. Future wars are likely to be a good deal more difficult and we really shouldn't get complacent. <laughs> 
Looking ahead to the future, I... I can't help but wonder. The brass and research teams are working on aircraft and weaponry that are going to seem as, as amazing to the kids today as today's weapons seem to the old-timers like me. Who would have known that, that we'd end up with aircraft that were, for all intents and purposes, invisible? Who would have imagined that missions would break down and specialize so precisely that entire aircraft would be designed for just a single task? I look at what's on the drawing boards. The fighters with vectored thrust that allows them to turn at impossible angles. The supersonic bombers that can fly so close to the ground, radar can't find them. And I wonder what the future will bring. There's no such thing as seat of the pants flying anymore. Training is likely to take years instead of the days it once took. It's a new world we face out there, where threats crop up in moments but solutions take decades to develop. Which is why, come to think of it, the United States Air Force continues on its flight path. Because there's always a place somewhere out there where the possibilities of technology and the reality of battle meet. That's the place, when it comes to it, where I want to be. <laughs>